What's going on today, guys? Welcome back to the channel. My name is Jay. Today is Sunday, March 27th, and I thought it might be cool to do a little something different here, do a little Q&A, a little chit-chat. Uh, it's a very cold, snowy Sunday. I don't know how it is out by where you are, but here in western New York, uh, the weather can be pretty much hit or miss in March and April. God willing, this is the last snowfall we're going to have, last significant snowfall. I only got like two or three inches last night, so it's not too bad. But yeah, I'm ready for summer to be here. I don't know about you guys. Um, not a snow person. But I'll tell you this, in western New York, we don't have tornadoes, we don't have floods, we don't have volcanoes, earthquakes, any natural disasters that basically can rip the roof off of your house, we don't get that. For that reason alone, it's a nice place to live. I'm actually five minutes from Lake Erie, so being along the Great Lakes is nice too, so you can do, get your water sports in, go to the beach, sit in the sun, go swimming, whatever you wanna do. Uh, there's a lot of beautiful houses along the lake. And it's nice living by a lake because, unlike the ocean, there's no sharks in it. So you can go swimming and not fear for your life. So that's kind of cool. So yeah, grab yourself a coffee or tea or whatever it is you drink. And uh, let's just hang out and talk for a few minutes. I figured I'd do a weekly Sunday thing and uh, kick it off. We're just going to do a little Q&A session. You know, some of the frequently asked questions that guitar players get. And some of the questions I've received recently. And uh, so let, without further ado, let's just get into it. So... Question number one in everybody's mind is, what string gauge do you use? Uh, there's a lot of factors that go into play in determining what string gauge you should use, depending on what type of guitar you have, what type of tunings you're going to use, what the scale length is, the next scale length, um, what genres of music you're going to play, right? So that all goes into play. So that all factors in. And because of all those factors, and because I have many guitars, lots of, well, not many, but I've got enough different guitars. I've got them in different tunings. I'm actually using five different string gauges right now. Five. Yeah. Uh, it's pretty crazy. I can't really keep it straight, to be honest. So I have to keep a little note on my computer and on my phone, a little spreadsheet to remind me of every guitar I have, what tuning I keep it in, what string gauge I'm using. And I even keep a note of when I last changed each set of strings. So that way I know if it's been a month, six months, or a year, right? Very helpful. Uh, if you have owned more than one guitar, you probably should do the same if you're using different tunings. Between my five different tunings, I'm basically going, my lowest gauge is 9 to 42s, and my highest gauge is like 11 to 52, I believe. Or 11 to, yeah, 11 to 52 for six string. And then I've got 11 to 58s on my seven string. Um, that's still on the lighter end of the spectrum for most people that play seven string guitars, I believe. People like to usually have like a 60 or something heavier on that low E. I just don't want something that thick. I don't really need it, you know, for my playing style. I play fairly heavy when I pick the strings, but I don't think I'm somebody who just like jams on it so hard that I really need to have that super thick string. Plus, I'm not detuning that much. Most of my detuned guitars are either half step, full step, drop D, or, you know, some, some mixture of those combined, right? I think my lowest one that I'm using right now is uh, drop C sharp. Not that low, but low enough for me. I enjoy it. It's good, it's good to go. Yeah, I've been playing Ernie Ball strings for years. For no particular reason, I'm just, you know, I'm familiar with them, I'm used to them, I know what they cost, I know where to get them, and uh, they're easily accessible pretty much everywhere, so it's, it's nice. You know, it works for me. But yeah, five different string gauges is way too many. I realize that seems a little crazy, but you do what you gotta do, right? Especially if you've got guitars in different scale lengths. You've got the Fender versus Gibson scale length at three quarters of an inch. Doesn't seem like a lot, but it really makes a difference. Huge difference in the tension of the strings depending what gauge you've got on. So that being said, I'm all over the board with it. However, I would recommend this. If you're somebody who only has one guitar or you only play um, standard tuning, A440 standard tuning, I would probably say you're probably gonna go with a nine or 10 gauge. You know, nine to, two, nine to 42 or 10 to 46, you know, some variation of those two. But now what's really nice is that some manufacturers are doing the half step gauges. So nine and a half to 44, the Goldilocks, perfect string gauge. I swear you will love it. If you've never tried it, never heard of it, go out and try it today. Or if you're somebody, conversely, if you're playing tens and you wanna to jump to 11s and feel like 11 is just too tense, too thick, too tight, whatever, they've got 10 and a halfs as well. So, you know, it's a perfect fix, man, I'm telling you. You won't have to do any custom mismatched, you know, sets to make your set work for you. Nine and a halfs or 10 and a halfs are great. So the next question is, what's the next guitar I intend to get? Well, the answer is I don't intend to get any more guitars because I've got too many already. Uh, I went on a steady uh, buying spree over the past two years and I now have approximately 12 electric guitars and an acoustic guitar and an electric bass. 
I don't need any more, honestly, guys. It's fun to, you know, kind of collect them all and have a whole bunch at your disposal. But if I'm being honest, how often are you playing all those guitars, right? How often are they just sitting up on the wall or in a case somewhere, not even getting looked at or touched? I tend to pick up one guitar per week and kind of just use that guitar for like one or two weeks straight. That's kind of how I do it. So when I'm writing something or playing something, I want to become familiar with that neck and the feel of that guitar. So I'll play it for a while. I don't like to jump back and forth between different guitars. That's unless you're going for a different sound and you have to do that. But yeah, 12 guitars is far too many. That being said, in the future, uh, if I ever do get another guitar, I would look into getting a Mayonnaise custom made. Uh, they're a builder out of Poland, if you're not familiar with them. And I think also Skirvason is also out of Poland, I believe, don't quote me. But yeah, they're another custom manufacturer, really high-end builds, very expensive. You can customize them soup to nuts, top to bottom, everything in between. And the one I spec'd out on their website is somewhere in the $5,000 range. So I do not need that right now. That's a want, that's down the line, you know, a couple of years. And if anything, I'll probably sell some of my guitars to help defray the cost of that one. Don't feel obligated to buy just whatever's at your local guitar store. Definitely get online and look around and figure out what's best for you, what you really need, as opposed to just what you want or what's convenient, you know? Wait out a while. If you're looking for a specific guitar in a specific color or a specific pickup configuration, hold out until you find it, man. It's, it's gonna be worthwhile. And when you find that gem, that perfect one that you wanted, you're gonna be you're gonna love it that much more so yeah mayonnaise for me that's the next one on my list that's gonna be quite a while from now but that will be really cool somebody asked about the cat the cat that you'd see my cat walking around in the background in some of my videos in the past uh, unfortunately she passed away a few months ago and uh, sorry to say you know she will be sorely missed in the household uh, she was a great cat her name was Sasha never called her by her name always called her monster um, she had that nickname since she was little little kitten but yeah, she lived to be about 11 and a half years old, which I would say, is that an average or is that a little bit on the low end for cats? I think, I feel like it's a little bit short, but you know, what have you, what can you do? She had some cancer, uh, cancerous growth in her jaw and it was going to be thousands of dollars, you know, to remove it and then she wouldn't have her jaw and she would need all kinds of treatments. And at that age, it really doesn't make sense. So yeah, unfortunately we had to put her down. Um, sorry to say. Do I prefer virtual amps or real amps? Okay, so here's the rundown on it. So I've got my Marshall 412 cabinet and my 90s rack gear, which has a huge tube power amp in it and a tube preamp. Uh, sounds great, it's really loud and really unnecessary <laughs> to have such a huge rig uh, for a household. Never needed that much power, but you know, back in the 90s and early 2000s, that's what was they were selling, that's what they were pushing. So it was like the bigger the better, right? However, my, um, I really have a, uh, I really have a pretty decent appreciation for the virtual amps that are coming out nowadays. I mean, they sound really good. Are they perfect? No. Uh, they simulate, they're a simulation of a real amp or some real signal chain, someone else's IR. You know, it's a simulation of that, an emulation of it rather. There are times when the virtual amps, the VST plugins, they sound a little bit fake. You can kind of tell because, for instance, you don't get such, um, a large swath of dynamic range from the virtual amps. Whether you're hitting the strings hard or soft, there isn't really a lot of volume difference depending on your velocity. You don't really hear a change in the note structure. It's pretty much the same note, just a little quieter, or a little louder. So the, as far as the dynamic range goes, you're really not getting the same feel and characteristic that you would get from a real tube amplifier. Even a real solid state amplifier sounds better. Also, I've noticed this too, guys. With virtual amps, uh, there's a certain note range for me i notice it right in the middle of the neck if you're doing like uh, staccato type stuff like nuno betancourt like palm muted you know runs some of those single note stuff and you're not really really high gain you're gonna hear that it sounds kind of fake you notice the characteristic of, of the note it just sounds fake i don't know how else to put it that's kind of a concern of mine you know that, that kind of bugs me a little bit because when you want to record if you want to play some stuff in that range you're gonna get that effect that being said if you're more of a metal player and you're playing the really high gain stuff and you're just cranking it up, you know, it's so compressed that it's gonna just hide, it's gonna mask all that stuff. So you're not even gonna notice. So if you're more of the heavy, heavy genres, the heavy, heavy uh, gain tones, you're good to go with the virtual amps, they sound great. And they're more reliable because 
they always sound the same. There's no tube that has to warm up or gets burnt out, goes microphonic, this and that, you know, different temperatures affect it differently, different voltages in the wall are gonna affect your amps differently. The virtual amps, the plugins always sound the same. It's very reliable. You can turn it on the next day and it sounds exactly like it did when you made created that tone the day before, the week before. For that reason alone, I think it's really convenient. It's really nice to have the virtual stuff. If you're not doing that yet, if you're not really somebody who's into computers and doing the plugins and all that good stuff, I would say look into it. It's a lot of fun. I didn't know what the phrase plugin meant two years ago. Just two years ago, guys. I didn't know what that was about because I wasn't really online in social media in the guitar community. I was just kind of like on the sidelines. I hadn't played guitar for a long time, just kind of put it aside for a few years. I got into it and just kind of started looking into everything and researching and taught myself all about DAWs and, and the software and virtual amps and plugins and all that stuff. So uh, I'm glad I've discovered it all. I'm glad I've kind of learned how to utilize it. And through the YouTube community, you know, essentially I've learned how to really kind of dial in great tones with this stuff and work with it. It's a lot of fun. Uh, do I play live or have I played live in the past? So I was in a band many years ago and I haven't been in one since. I'm really jonesing to get back out there. I think that um, at this point I feel like I'm really ready to go play live. I would love to form a new band, you know, maybe do original content. But if I'm not going to do original stuff, I would probably just, I, I hate to say it guys, I'd probably go the 80s hair metal route. If I had to do covers, that's probably what I would be doing. Maybe some a little bit newer stuff, but I mean, pretty much the 80s style metal. Um, I'm all about it. You guys know, you've seen the channel. But as far as the new stuff goes, if I was going to do a band, form a band today that's going to play the music I want to play, it's going to be more prog metal, prog rock stuff. It's going to be melodic. It's going to be, you know, kind of like dream theater. But I mean, you know, obviously I can't play <laughs> like Petrucci, but it's going to sort of be like a dream theater thing or Queensryche. Uh, if you're not familiar with Queensryche, got to go check them out, man. Queensryche is kind of like the forefather to dream theater. Same type of music, just a little bit older, a decade or so older. Queensryche, you know, if I could have one band that would get back together with one of my favorite groups of all time, it would be Queensryche. So if you're not really familiar with them, uh, they split up years back. And Jeff Tate, who's the lead singer, went his own route. And some of the other musicians went a different route. And for a while, they were both calling themselves Queensryche. And then one of them had to, like, pay for the rights to use the, the name. And it's a whole mess. I don't really know why they broke up because they did a bunch of albums together and they were together for, I, I don't know, 10 or 20 years. If you've never even heard of them, guys, go listen to the album Empire, front to back. It's amazing. If you like Dream Theater, if you like anything of that type of genre, the prog metal stuff, listen to Queensryche, you will be blown away. That's all I gotta say. Empire, check it out. So what are some of my influences, my musical influences? Um, you might be surprised to hear it, but most of the stuff that really influenced me was classic rock stuff. I mean, I'm talking the Beatles, Fleetwood Mac, Pink Floyd, Zeppelin, uh, I could go on and on. Uh, Crosby, Stills and Nash, Neil Young, Eric Clapton, Hendrix, The Who, all that stuff. I grew up listening to that. That's what my parents mostly played in the house when I was a really little kid. So that was kind of what I cut my teeth on was just classic rock and I learned to appreciate it. You're not going to meet too many people that like, that really appreciate and own a lot of music from so many different genres. It's just... That's where I'm from, man. That's 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 me. I'm always looking for the next thing. Some of the music I write, it's it's also pretty diverse. I mean, it just depends what I'm feeling. I could be doing a rock ballad. I could be doing some speed metal thing. I could be doing a, a finger picking acoustic thing. It just depends what my mood is and you know how the mood strikes and what I'm gonna write. So I think that might be a challenge when I go to start a new band. I'm really gonna have to winnow it down to uh, you know more of a specific genre in order to meet the criteria of the other members of the band, right? Most underrated guitar player ever. This is a tough one, right? Because I'm going to go with somebody. My choice, I'm going to go with a guy that you probably have never heard of. Maybe you have. If you're, old as me, if you're as old as I am, maybe you've heard of them. His name is Jeff Tyson, and he used to be in a group called T-Ride back in the, again, it was probably the early 2000s or late 1990s. He is one of the more famous uh, students of Joe Satriani along with Steve Vai, along with Kirk Hammett and a handful of others who actually made it and you know made, produced music afterwards, had a musical career afterwards. So now I believe Jeff Tyson is, I think he's like in his 50s and he's living in Prague or somewhere in Europe. He's like one of these like Marty Friedman, they just disappear off the planet and go move to Japan. I don't know why, but he lives somewhere in Europe and you haven't heard much from him. I know he put out an album 
recently over the past couple of years, I think he put out a, a small album. I think it was, you know, not really pushed too much. So I don't know if anyone's ever heard of it, but he was ridiculous. He was phenomenal. So the group was called T-Ride. They produced one album. I don't think it was very successful. It was kind of like, you know, you had to know about it or you didn't, you know, and somehow I managed to get a copy of the CD at some point back then. Jeff Tyson. I want to do a whole episode on him at some point and kind of like, you know, maybe play some of the songs a little bit. Um, you'd really like it. I mean, it, it, it was kind of beyond hair metal. It started, it came out of that genre, but it was so much better, man. I mean, the, the rhythms were ridiculous. The singing was insane. And I think it was just a trio. Uh, do I prefer a neck through construction on a, on a guitar as opposed to a bolt on? Well, I actually have both and I actually like both. I would probably say it's it's really tough decision. I, I, I probably would say I'd go with the bolt on neck only because if you ever want to change the neck, if the neck ever breaks in half, you can take it off and put a new one on. I mean, that's convenient. Otherwise, the guitar is pretty much done. I've got both. My Amarox, those are neck through. They feel great. They sound great. The nice thing about a neck through design, you know, also like with Solars and stuff like that is the neck just curves right up to the back of the body. There's no heel. There's no heel joint in your hand to kind of get in the way. So it's extremely comfortable to just pick up and hold or play up on the higher register. So yeah, that being said though, I'm still a neck, a bolt on neck guy. All right, guys. Well, it looks like the weather is getting worse. I should wrap this up, but happy Sunday to you all. Thanks for stopping by. Don't forget to hit the like button. Subscribe if you haven't already. We're getting there, man. We're getting to that, shooting for that 1,000 subscribers. Really appreciate all of the help you guys have had supporting the channel. Keep it up. Keeping me motivated. I appreciate it. I'll talk to you guys soon. I'm out of here. See ya.